Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second um, lecture in our uh, winter series for the Carlo Historical and Archaeological Society. Um, you're all most welcome. We attempted last week to do this as a hybrid lecture, um, but due to serious technical hitches, both on sound and on slides, um, only those who were actually present in the room actually um, got to hear the full thing. So thanks very much to Christopher Power for agreeing to um, effectively give it Mark II and um, that we can enjoy it again. As I said last week, um, the way we're doing it by Zoom and the effect of the online version, um, we have to thank the um, COVID emergency funding for community organizations as administered by the Carlo LCDC um, for funding and helping buying the equipment uh, to enable us to do it successfully. Um, the subject matter uh, tonight, as I said last week, is hugely interesting for anyone in town. Uh, most people will remember that where Penny's currently is was Thompson's and prior to that was Carlo New Jail. Um, and there was an older jail, which Christopher will refer to in his uh, talk. And in effect, the uh, Bridewell Lane, as we know it, um, came from the Carlo Assizes, which was Titan Hall, up along to the then old jail. Um, but luckily, the records of the, uh, the jail have survived. So from mid 1700s onwards, uh, Chris is going to deal with this talk. And again, um, for those interested, it's worth popping into Carlo uh, County Museum because um, they have a couple of artifacts from the jail in there, one being the trap door upon which um, people were, as uh, you've mystically put, launched into eternity. Uh, and the second thing they have there, which um, is fascinating, is a cell window. And carved out of that cell window is a piece to hide your illicit pipe and your tobacco um, if you're a prisoner in the jail. So without further ado, um, we'll go over to Christopher Barr, who is our favourite local librarian, um, and um, we'll enjoy his lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauri. Thanks, thanks a million. Um, the, I suppose that the, the title of this paper is um, my in reference to what the, the despair people have felt there was it's it's fear and dread of his life which is uh, one of the comments that one of the, the prisoners made um, from the prison records um as a small child passing through carlo in the 1980s it was a subject of fascination to go up at the stag and iron horses heads which ornament the walls of thompson's engineering works as imposing as ever with their bulbous eyes they still looked down on Kennedy Avenue. The door underneath the stag's head in the grim wall was firmly closed whenever I passed it and all was quiet. Um, I wasn't aware at the time, but this building with a trio of iron heads was originally Carlo Jail. And I was even less mindful that it was in fact Carlo's new jail and that the original castellated building synonymous with the 1798 rebellion used to stand directly across the road. As Peter Thomas observed in his 1983 article in Carloviana, it was in fact Carlos third jail. Now all trace of the first is lost, even its location. Uh, it, there's a suggestion that may have uh, been located on Tulla Street, possibly around where Deals is now, somewhere or maybe in that vicinity, but anyway, it, it's long gone. Um, its successor was demolished in the 1990s. And for many years prior to its demolition, this equally grim but very ramshackle and ancient structure was used as a storage facility by Gillespie's corn merchants. At this far remove, all trace of this of original building is also gone and has been replaced by modern developments. Uh, its successor, which is now Carroll Shopping Centre, would originally have faced its predecessor across the street. And so it would have been a very nice, lovely sight to see one prison looking out across at the other one. Many buildings and institutions such as Carlo Jail were replaced and enlarged in the aftermath of the 1798 rebellion. The recent insurrection having profoundly rattled the establishment and brought into question their control over the general population. New court buildings and Carlo Court itself is a very fine example 
and jails were constructed after the rebellion. And as a response to the later resistance uh, up to 1801, which occurred in County Wicklow and was led by characters such as the charismatic rebel leader, General Michael Dwyer. Many of these grandiose buildings were often far more elaborate and spacious than the local population actually required or probably welcomed. Um, there are examples in, in say, in Baltic Glass Court is very large in comparison, in comparison to the size of the town. Uh, Wicklow Court is a fabulous building, another very large building. So they all, they were all disproportionately uh, sized to, to what was actually needed, I suppose. The street party referred to at Pridewell Lane gives some inkling of its original purpose. Now, Bridewell Lane itself uh, has largely disappeared as a discernible street. Um, it's at the back of the social welfare offices and it comes out onto Dublin Street and it faces they all more or less, it's nearly directly across from it. So it gives some idea of that from the assizes that were held there to the jail. Um, a lot of the street has actually disappeared under the has has disappeared where the Dinry car park is and so on. By good fortune and foresight, a large archive of material has survived from the period as a testament to the grim realities of prison life and the logistical issues involved with caring for the prison inmates. This material which forms part of the archive um, and very locally it, it's, it has since fascinating administrative materials in relatively large quantities from approximately 1760 until 1899 um, and it seems to contain a great deal of material from those those dates the collection of jail records was restored as part of the grant the county's grand jury records and mostly concerns payment for food which was provided to prisoners um, and also it, it would have been actually stored uh, in, in originally in Carlow Court and some of the paperwork actually still has the smell of the coal fires that were used to heat the offices. Despite the documents in immense age, they contain a wealth of clearly legible detail, all very neatly written on small fragments of parchment. And this is very interesting considering that the buildings involved are gone or utter. A couple of examples of material from the prison records would be Carlo March the 25th, 1763, received from the Reverend Mr. Richard Mill, system of six pounds delivered to the prisoners of Carlo since the last assizes, signed John Davis. Carlo July the 20th, 1763, received from the Reverend Richard Mills the sum of seven pounds, 15 and eight pence due for bread delivered to the prisoners of Carlow since the last assizes, signed Mary Ann. Meticulous records were kept in a neat ledger format. Um, accounts were clearly headed, an account of bread brought by John Davis delivered for prisoners of Carlow. And a further affidavit is worded as follows. George Bernard Sleater of the town of Carlow came before me this day and made oath on the Holy Evangelist that the sum of two pounds, 10 shillings is due to him since the last assizes for one half year salary for keeping of the courthouse and jail sworn before me this 29th day, George Bernard of August 1775, M. Scott. A similar note was compiled in relation to Richard Mills, a man who featured prominently in the administration of the prison, providing prisoners, provi providing provisions for the prisoners. The Reverend Richard Mills, and made oath that he has frequently visited the jail of Carlo since last assizes and had the prisoners duly served with bread, that he has kept a regular account of same to lay before the grand jury. This affixes amounting to the whole by a balance due last account of two pounds, 10 shillings to the sum of 31 pounds, 16 and sixpence. And praise your worship to grant him in consideration of his trouble, the sum of five pounds, 10 shillings, according to the late act in that case made and provided. Reverend Mills. This is just a, a sample of the, of the material that has survived. There's a great deal more, but it just gives an account of the administration of, of the prison 
Um, Mills himself was born in Carlow in 1728. Uh, he was the son of a Reverend Michael Mills and Catherine Ratburn. Their wedding is listed as having occurred on October 6, 1712, and is recorded in the parish register of marriages. His father was a native of Galway and had a rec uh, um, was the joint rector of St. Warburg's in Dublin, which is a common enough thing to have a, um, two, two parishes far removed. Um, Richard was born presumably in Fenna, and his mother died. His brother was known as Ratburn Mills and became a noted Dublin surgeon at the time. Richard married in 1776 to a woman named Frances Wilson, and he went on to have nine children and lived for much of his life actually later in Dublin. Um, he died in 1805 at the age of 64. Um, I, I also, I, I believe his, his father may well be buried in Fenna Church. Um, story records outlining details such as the modest costs incurred by Richard Mills, providing Carlow prisoners with their daily bread. Other topics relating to the governance of the county have also survived. So these will be things such as orders for road repairs, uh, elected lists for petty jurors, and various grand jury records and a great deal of other material, which is actually fascinating and is really, we're only beginning to realize what's in it now. Perhaps the most extraordinary record that still exists uh, are the lists of prisoners, crimes and misdemeanors, which date from approximately 1760 to 1860. Unfortunately, the chronology is not consistent and regrettably does not appear to contain information from the crucial period culminating during the 1798 rebellion. As an aside, this period is represented by an intriguing and voluminous quantity of applications for the possession of firearms, which stem particularly from the years 1796 and 1797, which of course was the very eve of the 98 rebellion. Now, the applications resulted in the printing of certificates, which were an official permission for notification of keeping arms. The pre-printed documents, which were printed by George Grierson described as his magic, just his printer, yeah, wide section of Carlos population. Dating in their wide social and demographic spread, which feature, featured both Protestant and Catholic, urban and rural, perhaps most surprisingly, female property owners also appear. One individual was named Bridget Fitzpatrick of Ballygown, Tullaclu and was amongst the number of individuals granted a license. The pre-printed applications include the personal detail, the dates and the signature of the county sheriff, all of which were included. Such as Barnaby Sly, David Nolan, Edgars, James Min, James, Name throughout these documents and all their names that are relatively common in Carlo or very common, some of them. Carlo was fortunate, if that is the correct term, that many of its fascinating trial records have survived, making an extraordinary collection in its own right. These carefully produced records for the county are a perfect example of brevity and the workings of a well oiled bureaucracy. They listed misdemeanors pending sentence to be posed for an almost inexhaustible catalogue of crimes, from seemingly ludicrous and poignant actions of desperate individuals to heinous acts of rape and murder, which unfortunately were surprisingly common. A number of examples are included, giving an indication of the wrongdoings which are regularly presented to the local magistrate who presided in court in the, or presided even from their own residence at times. Um, the sentence generally resulted in the imposition of the harshest punishments on the unfortunates concerned. Even minor infringements had a standard penalty. For example, in the 1850s, the standard penalty for any kind of public drinking, rowdy or otherwise, was 48 hours in jail without hard labour. So that would be a sobering thought if you had done a few staggers coming out of the pub. The fate of many of those mentioned below are lost, but it can be assumed that incarceration, harsh manual labour on the mindless treadmill, which existed in Carlow Jail until the building was sold in 1897, 
transportation to the bush, bushlands of Australia, never to return, or in a small number of instances, to step through the windows overlooking the prison entrance onto a narrow platform under the watchful gaze of a raucous and cheering crowd. The following is a list of various crimes, some serious, others less so. John Kyo, age 38, brought before J.H. Eustace, was charged on oath with being a dangerous lunatic. Catherine Byrne, age 22, charged with having deserted her male child at Bennett Kerry on the 26th of February, 1847. Catherine Smith, age also before J.H. Eustace, charged on oath with having hid a gown in the field on the lands of Mount Woolsey in said county on the 16th of July, 1847, the property of Elizabeth Butler and was felicity stolen from her on the night of the 15th of July, 1847. Martin Keppel, aged 37, charged on oath of having milked a cow, the property of John James Leckie Esquire at Ballykeely on the night of the 4th of July, 1847, and had one quart of milk in a gal, the property of said JJ Leckie Esquire. Similar misdemeanors are further listed. Martin Nolan, Jeremiah Kyo, and Thomas Nolan charged with stealing potatoes from Catherine Dunahoo of Michel with hand stolen potatoes on 11 of January 1850. Mary Cuff, age 36, and Edward Whelan, age 16, similarly charged for handling stolen potatoes in Hackettstown. John Kenny, 16 years, was charged by William Duckett stealing bread in Tulla on the 3rd of January 1850. All of the above offences were committed in and around 1847, at the height of the Irish famine, only too well the desperate acts of many people as the country starved. Robbing potatoes from the ground, clandestinely milking a cow, were indicative of very real hunger which ravaged the land. And continues in a similar vein. Catherine Byrne and Mary Byrne, age 52, charged upon oath with having stolen a duck in the possession of Patrick Wells on the 17th instant. Joseph Mulhall, 40 years, brought before C.H. Tucker, charged upon oath with having stolen a pair of winkers, value of three shillings from outside the shop of James Farney at Carlow this day and his property. Serious violent crimes are listed in the next few entries. Matthew Kinsley, age 26, charged on oath with having assaulted Sarah Curran at Racking Dorn on the 14th of July, 1847, and they then and there attempt to commit a rape upon her body. 23rd of April, 1847, John Behan, age 32, arraigned on five offences. The entry continues, charged before a coroner's jury on oath with, with having on the 7th day of February, 1847, murdered John Kelly, a crana in said county, by fracturing his skull in several places and breaking one of his arms by blows of a shovel and a stone which deprived the said John Kelly of his life. Garrett Moore, age 30, was before Edward Gorman, Esquire, charged with injuries on Sylvester O'Brien, which caused his death. Patrick Brennan, age 50, brought before W. Carey, Esquire, the 23rd of March, 1847, charged upon oath before a coroner jury assembled at Carroll on the 11th of February, 1847, who found on the roads that Robert Hines came by his death in consequences of a stab of a pitchfork inflicted by Patrick Brennan on Saturday, the 6th of February, 1847, at Carlow. The record extended only to, des to describing the crimes sending forward the various defendants for trial. Presumably, they were subjected to the full rigours of the law. Area records are also included in the county archive containing details of interesting criminal activities. Such details are included in a document entitled a calendar of prisoners committed to the jail of said county since the last assizes for trial, Lent assizes 1831. Ellen Byrne, 41, committed September 1830, charged of being a strolling vagrant without any settled place of residence, post town Carlow. She was held in custody. The next entries for the same period are as follows Matthew Kinsa, age 30, committed by William Fishburne, Esquire, 27th September. September 1830, charged with having stolen an ass. Um, Kinsey is dealt with by being bailed by W. Fishburne. Patrick O'Neill, age 40, committed by John Whelan, the um, 17th of February 1831, charged upon oath with having, on the month of October last, assaulted 
Catherine Byrne and attempted to commit a rape upon her person at Tola Hill in the said county. William Hanahan, age 57, charged on the oath of Nicholas Lyons of said company with having stripped part of the thatch from off his barn and taking a pitchfork or some such weapon in his hand, forced his servant, man and boy out of the barn by which he was put in fear and dread of his life, post town Lachlan Bridge. A disturbing and very confusing incident is described as follows. James Nolan, age 34, committed by John Watson, 20th of October, 1830, charged with feloniously breaking open the house of Anne McGee on the night of the 18th of October, dragging her to a bridge and knocked her down, forced his knees on her stomach, swore he would put out her entrails and make her eat a book which he had if she would not take her oath that she would never injure Patrick Regan or his wife, having his face blackened and aided and assisted by three other persons not positively known to the informant, Post Town Michel held in custody. William Fishburne features prominently in the Carlow jail records. Unusually for the period, he lived a very long life, dying at the extraordinarily advanced age of 88 in 1855. Carlo, with business interests in the novel enterprise of the newly developed court services available in Ireland. Fishburne was first called to the Grand Jury 70 permanent of the local yeomanry at the same period, coinciding with the events of the 98 Rebellion. He later became a Justice of the Peace. The family were considerable landowners on Tulla Street. On the subject of 1798, a seminal event in Irish history, court records reflect the trauma of the post-rebellion years, just as the records of the 1840s reflect the desperation of many during that period. The response after 1798 was the imposition of draconian these early records contained in the county archive fascinating details despite the collection year of 1912 famous or infamous personalities associated with the event appear in print on this note the case is brought before lord john cornwall of the crappy boy song frame uh, who was resident in michel are listed as follows the document is reproduced in the graceful script of the court clerk and names the defendants, their crimes and status. The records also contain the relevant justices' names. Calendar of prisoners in actual custody of John J. Cornwall, Esquire, High Sheriff of the County of Carlow, January Sessions, 1818. John Redmond, sheep stealing in custody. Joseph Lennon, threatening his brother's wife in custody. John Roberts, a noted robber in custody. Tady Doyle, stealing, stealing potatoes, death, death respited. William Townsend, aiding, assisting in a burglary and robbery to be transported for 11 years. Patrick O'Neill, stealing a firkin of butter, certified three months. James Highland, house robbery and jailbreaking, transportation for 11 years. John Toole, house stealing in custody. Mary Brennan, stealing of geese in custody. Patrick Wallace, rioting in Queens County. Uh, four other individuals rioting at Carlo. Man named, named Lowry breaking the pounding grade, held in custody. The exams of below contain the penalties handed down for, mis, for, for misdemeanors, various kinds. Calendar of prisoners in the jail of Carlow, the 12th of January 1830, five prisoners of both in. Garrett Cloney for robbing a letter conveyed by Walt, Walter Blackney Esquire, seven years transportation. Johanna Wood for robbing a shop tried before a barrister, two years hard labour. Michael Moore and Bridget Henry for being vagrants, seven years transportation. Where all these events occurred in Carlow Jail, um, in the actual jail itself over the years, discuss, discussing various aspects, namely a Carlovian article from 1960 and another from 1983. Carlo is very fortunate that much of the infrastructure of the prison, despite its grim legacy, is intact and a use piece, a unique piece of functional Georgian architecture. Now, as we know as Carlo Shopping Centre. Many of these features have been thankfully retained to the present and have luckily survived throughout Thompson Engineering's long use of the location as an industrial works. 
An exact description of the prison and its salient features immediately prior to its closure have survived thanks to the auction report from February 9, 1897. This is described by Teresa Kelly in um, 1960 in Carlo Viano. This description, which is reproduced, uh, go, goes as uh, describes as follows. On Tuesday, February 9, 1897, the old jail was offered for sale by public auction by directions of the County Carlo Grand Jury. The whole plot, which is rent free, covers two acres of ground. The premises consists of a governor's house, four stories, a matron's house, two stories, female prison of 30 cells, male prison of 35 cells, all surrounded by a 20 foot wall. The very obvious remnants of the jail are fascinating, with much beautiful, beautiful architectural heritage having survived a legacy of the poorest and sick of society. The adamantine granite walls surrounded with perfect proportions, encased with barred windows in high walls of cut limestone. Such details are apparent throughout. Uh, when anyone goes for a stroll around, these things are all to be seen. And, um, and at the center of it, it's dominated by the splendid governor's quarters, which also is very visible from the entrance of the shopping center. And as, as described as four stories, it's very large, quite a large building. Fascinating behind the scenes relics also remain, such as the tiny holding cells with their claustrophobically solid walls, which happen to flank the original condemned cell and these are positioned uh, directly in front of the gallows, which are actually on the first floor as you face the shopping center. It's directly over the main entrance. Beautifully built and utterly functional features such as a large brick fireplace in the basement, which is presumably built to heat a gigantic boiler, can also be seen. And that's positioned underneath the governor's house, down beneath the floors of the building, basically. Um, small details exist, such as a well-worn granite steps nearby and a steel rail, which happens to actually be to, to nowhere now, but just gives an idea of what the prison would have been originally like. So these are the, these are the various relics that are still, still there. The starkest reminder of the building's past history is inevitably encapsulated in the large double windows high above the main entrance, where many unfortunates met their end. Most famously, Lucinda Sly was executed at this place, the last woman to suffer such a fate in Ireland. Many forgotten, tormented individuals ended their savage days in a similar public spectacle high above the prison entrance before being swiftly buried in unmarked graves in the vicinity of the prison, which I believe would possibly have been around the area where the cinema is now. The building's profile has remained more or less unchanged throughout the site's use as an engineering works and later as a shopping center. Um, this is very apparent when standing at the main entrance where very little, as I say, has, has actually been altered except for a bit of modern signage and a few light fixtures. Much of the setting remains intact, including the holding cells themselves. And the main entrance is flanked by two, by twin spiral stairs which access the upper floors, which are on either side of the main entrance and are works of art in themselves. The trapdoor, which of course is now housed in Carlow County Museum, is the most chilling relic of the prison. Uh, but there is also near the, the, up, the windows upstairs, a small device embedded in the wall with a pulley, uh, which, part, which formed part of the rope mechanism, which is fed out to the platform and would have had the, the hangman's noose on it. So that's still there and it's still, as you can see there, it's quite, quite visible. It is impossible to determine how many individuals, some mentioned in this article, no doubt, uh, ended at this place. Their lives cut short as a result of acts of desperation, poverty and ignorance, and often on the very slimmest of evidence. as Havel works with the expected alterations, the building's footprint remains largely unaltered. Um, the grim prison walls, which st still stand adamantine around the jail, are very much there. 
After almost two centuries and a profound change of use to a shopping center, Carroll Prison still contains the residual memory of poor and desperate souls condemned to medieval punishments and oblivion. Their tragic life stories and hideous final moments reduced to a couple of faded manuscripts and witnessed by gray stone walls that do not speak. Thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to ask. Uh, thanks, Christopher. Um, that was an excellent lecture. Um, really enjoyed it and enjoyed it all the more so because you're talking about somewhere I know very well. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the interesting things which I, I found is that when it converted in the early 1990s to a shopping centre, and uh, you're talking about leaving architecture in place, um, just to the right hand side of what is now Penny's entrance, entrance um, it bears the, uh, the windows and the bars of the, the, some of the cells there. That became a children's creche that you could drop your kids into um, so that you could go shopping. So you could leave them in the cells effectively uh, while you did your shopping. Um, you know, it, it, it's fascinating. The other uh, bit you touched on, which again is a really interesting thing, is um, the, uh, Mr. Fishburne and the Fishburne Estates um, in that most of Upper Tullow Street um, uh, up to um, quite recently, and, and in some cases still, um, ground rents are still paid this day to the Fishburne Estate. Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating area. It's, it's a, an interesting area. And I found the lecture absolutely fascinating. And thank you very much. Um, so I suppose if anyone has any questions, um, if they unmute themselves uh, and come on and uh, Christopher will take any questions that you have. I think you're escaping likely. They're all either very shy or it's been yeah. so comprehensively covered that there are no questions. Um, so um, could I move on at this stage? John Kelly, would you like to do on behalf of the Society of Voter Thanks to uh, Christopher and his lecture tonight, please? Thanks very much, Maldrick. And um, thank you, Chris, for a great, entertaining and uh, um, fascinating talk. Um, of course, um, it's only very very small part of the full article you have on it, which is in Carlo Viana, which is coming out on, on the 2nd of December. So I have to get that little plug in there, but it's, it's, a, it's a great talk and um, an even greater article. Um, can I just ask you about the, the, the lady who was sent to transportation? Was that Eleanor Byrne? I, I, I didn't write it down. I, was Eleanor Byrne, was that her name? Uh, I think it was, yeah. Um, yeah. Because I've done a lot of research at that period, and I have, I have the report of her transportation. She was the scourge of the of the of the, the constabulary in Carlo. Um, Sergeant Valentine was constantly bringing her to court, and eventually she was um, she was sentenced. She she was um, she was asked to pay a five five pounds in recognizance, or she would be deported. But looking through the newspapers, a lot of these people actually never ended up being deported. It was a I think it was an easy enough sentence to get out if you knew someone. <laughs> but I think, you know, what tonight's okay. lecture really showed is, um, like, what a violent and um, unruly place Carlo was at that time, I suppose, with the, the memories of the 1798 rebellion, and there was a lot of um, um, political and religious strife in the town at the time. And when you look through the newspapers, you see um, prostitution, murder, infanticide, gangs, white boys, um, and for anybody who's interested in true crime, it really is something close to home. And I think you brought a, a sort of a feel for that as well, Chris. And although you're not a, 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 a Carlo man, I think you've made a significant contribution to Carlo Viana and to the Carlo Historical Ar Archaeological Society, as well as the work you do in um, Carlo, Carlo County Library um, and in the, in the Carlo archives. Um, and you're such a great um, resource and so helpful it's great to have you along tonight and hopefully we'll have lots more talks as well and lots more articles for Carlo Viana. So just on behalf of the society, um, we'd just like to thank you for tonight and offer a, a, a virtual vote of thanks for all your, and before I go, I have to give my mea culpa. We, we visited a disaster last week, all my fault. Um, and I'm, I have to apologize again to you, Chris. Um, total hubris, got a new camera 
and forgot how to turn up the sound on it. And that was the start of everything after that panic set in. So I think tonight was a lot better. So again, Chris, thanks very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, thank you. Just a, the, I'd just like to say there, just something you, you said, John, about the, the, the actual records. I mean, Carol's very lucky that these records have actually survived. And, and really a lot of the material, it's only the very tip of the iceberg. Uh, there were selected examples. Um, I just that I picked out, but there are a great deal more. Um, and so it, it does. And, and actually what you just said about that lady, that put some flesh on the bones because unfortunately they're just names and we don't know what happened to them after. So just to make that, that observation. And thank you very much, John. Uh, thanks, Chris, for that. Um, just two things. John mentioned that the launch of the Carlo Vienna is on the 2nd of December. So that's our next event, which will be carried online. So if you'd like to join us on the night for the, um, the launch of Carlo Vienna, um, mark it in your diary for the 2nd of December. And finally, um, if you'd like to support the work of the Society, and we actually, um, this is an appeal because it hasn't, hasn't been a great year for funds for the Society by way of memberships and donations, uh, please join the Society. It actually only costs 15 euros per annum uh, to be a member, uh, and it does help our work enormously. Um, and on that note, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, wish you good night.